So in an influential essay from 1865 on the function of criticism in Victorian England, critic and poet Matthew Arnold famously defined criticism as a disinterested endeavor to learn and propagate the best that is known and thought in the world. Almost 150 years later, this concept of criticism, dominant in European traditions, still uncannily places cultural criticism in a double bind. On the one hand, it powerfully situates criticism and cultural activity at the center of national identity. On the other hand, the idea of disinterestedness, or art for art's sake, has become a too familiar alibi, both to advocates and detractors of the arts, to justify the precarious separation of culture, criticism, and the arts from social, political life, as well as even government policy. For over 30 years as a writer, broadcaster, interviewer, and critic, Robert Enright has been redefining the function of criticism in a uniquely Canadian way by transforming the role of the critic as artist, to use a phrase of Oscar Wilde's, into the critic as artist. The critic as artist, actor, and educator. Bridging the unbridgeable divide between Canadian artists and their publics. In a recent article from February 2013, so just this last month, telling the lay of the hour of love, current engagements, and the literacy of art, Robert wrote the following, and I think we should pay attention to these words. They're very prophetic words. And I'll quote, what happens in our culture over the next four years will be critical in determining the kind of culture we'll have in the future and the nature of the art forms that will be its expression and its embodiment. We have a federal government that is hostile to the arts and that is unabashedly political in the way it is instrumentalizing the mechanisms that fund culture. At a time of crisis and change in higher education, one can't help but to see the fate of our cultural institutions and our communities as inherently linked to the fate of the arts and humanities as an educational institution in this country, perhaps in a shivering embrace. With these pressing questions in mind, the Public Humanities at Western is pleased to present tonight's lecture, the second of our four stellar lectures in the March Blueprint, Reimagining Public Engagement. Professor Enright is University Research Professor in Art Criticism at Guelph University and is one of Canada's most prominent cultural journalists. He was the founder and is currently the senior contributing editor to Border Crossings Magazine. He has received 14 nominations at the National and Western Magazine Awards for his writing in Border, Crossing, Border Crossings, sorry, winning four gold and two silver medals. He was an art critic for CBC Radio and Television for 25 years and continues to contribute to a number of network programs. He also contributes regularly to the Golden Mail and to other international art magazines, including Art Review, Modern Painters, Art News, and Contemporary. I am very, very pleased to welcome and introduce Professor Adam. Thanks, Josh. I stumble walking over here. Um, it's interesting, Matthew Arnold, I, I think of ignorant armies clashing by night when you mention the, the Canadian government. So. I won't get political tonight. Listen, I did something odd here. Um, I actually wrote a, a, a very sort of, um, I wrote a, a paper. Um, and, and so in a lot of ways, this, uh, what I do is I look at art and I write, and this is a combination of the two. Um, whether or not any thinking is engaged in the, in the position between those two activities, <laughs> you'll have to see. As I look at the audience, uh, I thought perhaps this would be more public, that is to say, more people other than people who are at universities. And if I'd, if I'd known that, I pro I'm probably going to say nothing tonight that you don't already know. So think of this simply as, as a kind of as comfort food, a, a kind of way that I'm going to say the things that, that you've already recognized as being true, and, and that will make you feel good and me feel good, and nothing radical will get said. But, um, <laughs> but, it, it, but some of what I'm going to say is, is probably still not, a, not, not comfortable in that um, I'm talking a lot about the body, and the body is always a, a contested area for all kinds of reasons. But I'm going to read this paper, and I hope I don't bore you um, in reading it. Um, I, I was, I've been a little bit ill. I got a cold the last time I was in Winnipeg, and as a result, I had a fever. And I, think of, I was thinking of June Carter and, and Johnny Cash and how they got married in a fever. I somehow married language in a fever and wrote way more than I thought I was going to do. So I better start, or you may never get the hell out of here, and that wouldn't be good for any one of us. So as you know, this is called the compounded eye. Beauty, the body, its beholders and beholdings. <clears throat> Anyone familiar with entomology will recognize that the title of my talk this evening is provoked by the eye of the common housefly, that irritating, useless, and disease-carrying insect that has few friends in nature or culture, 
with the possible exception of David Cronenberg. I choose it because it reflects the many portals of looking that I want to suggest is the current perspective from which we look at art. And it conspicuously draws our attention through the seer, and not necessarily through the thing seen, to an important dimension of my inquiry into beauty. The more compounded the eye, the more complex the looking, or the more ways of looking there are. The title, of course, additionally plays off the cliché about the apprehension and judgment of beauty. Its discovery in the eye of the beholder is a recognition of a vast subjectivity. One person's beauty is another's plainness or ugliness, and so it goes. The history of art is replete with shifts in attitudes toward what, towards what constitutes beauty, and I would be deceiving you if I promised to somehow bring into singular focus the myriad ways that beauty has been regarded. But I hope to use that history to help in my ocular roaming across 2,000 years, from classical Rome through the Renaissance and into the period in which we live. Without falling into the role of vigil explainer, a village explainer, I would also suggest that the idea of beholding refers not only to the thing beheld, but equally to the debt owed artists today, to artists who've looked before them. The road that artists walk is a pavement of citations, and all the painters I'll refer to tonight are clear in their borings from their painterly predecessors. They acknowledge that they are beholden. I've been using the word thing in referring to what it is we're going to be looking at, but that's misleading to the extent that it suggests we'll be looking at objects when in truth we'll be looking at bodies, at the human figure in a wide spectrum of representations. And in that scrutiny, I'm looking for what a number of contemporary artists consider beautiful. The body is a particularly good subject for this inquiry because it's the site for all manner of representations. There is nothing we cannot register on the body. So I almost needn't say that in trying to figure out what is beautiful, we will invariably end up encountering its opposite. St. Augustine in the fourth century came up with a canny definition of evil. He simply characterized it as the absence of goodness, a bit tidy bit of sophistry that while it admits that evil exists, gives it only the status of what it lacks. Evil is an inverse. In this world of logic, it's possible to see ugliness as merely the absence of beauty. A final thing about my title, in the original 1958 version of The Fly, you might remember a scene that was inadvertently the funniest in the film. Andre is a scientist who's invented a transporter device called the Disintegrator Integrator. I won't deny that this, this connected process of disintegrating and then integrating could be a description of one aspect of the relationship between past and present depictions of beauty in art history. When a white-headed fly lands in the chamber, Andre's genes are mixed with the insects, fashioning an altogether new recombinant species. In Cronenberg's 1986 remake, it gets named. The scientist is Seth Brundle, the species is the Brundle fly. Andre's combination goes unnamed, and we finally see it at the end of the film caught in a web while a spider advances towards it. On a tiny fly body with an appropriately tiny human head, we hear a tiny voice crying, help me, help me. While my head sits on what is still a reasonably normal body, I'm sympathetic to the fly man caught inside a web of his own making. Looking at the transformations of the body in art is fraught with danger. The many eyes of the fly meet the many legs of the spider. By the end of this talk, it may be my tiny voice that you hear emitting a call for help, which perhaps your questions might, will provide. It's a proven rhetorical device to define by negation, to say what you're not going to do before you set about to do it. So, this is not an exhaustive survey of the body's representation through art history. I like to think its trajectory across time is more like a comet, tracing some highlights and leaving much of the sky dark. It is also not an exhaustive consideration of the range of artistic disciplines in which contemporary artists currently labor. With a few excursions into sculpture, I'm concentrating my comments primarily on painting. I have mentioned that my focus will be the body, but I'm conspicuously avoiding a whole category of religious art depicting that subject. There are none of the crucifixions, depositions, martyrdoms, ascensions, or assumptions that make up the fluctuating cycle of life, death, and rebirth that is central to the Christian story. It's a narrative in which the word is made flesh, a tantalizing transformation, and there is much to say about it, but not here and now. It does make me think, though, of the situation that the architect and urban theorist Rem Koolhaas has designated in junk space as a new gospel of ugliness. That is a scripture in which we could perform a stimulating exegesis. All of what I said so far, and all of what I will say before I'm through, is being filtered through an optical register. That is, it's about looking, and anyone with even the most rudimentary awareness of that phenomenology knows that it's a very complicated terrain, made especially problematic by a four-letter word, the gaze. My argument 
is not that the gaze has gone away or that the complication of looking that arises from representation is any less intense now than it was when the problem raised its cyclopean head in the early 1970s. I'm simply saying that what is most apparent when we look at contemporary art, and particularly painting over the last three decades, is that there are many more gazers than before, and among the best are women. The question that needs to be addressed is whether the gaze is gendered and formulated today in the way it was in 1975, when Laurie Mulvey published her now canonical essay, Visual Pleasure and Narrative Cinema, in the British film journal Screen. To use Mulvey's hyphenated phrase, the gaze is still about to be looked atness. It is still about who gets looked at and why and what are the implications of that looking. It is still a measure of and a negotiation with power. But that power has broadened and a good portion of this talk will discuss the work of a group of women artists, including Marlene Duma, Lisa Yuskavich, Cecily Brown, Sarah Lucas, Tracy Emin, and Dana Schutz, who are central to that widening. In a number of cases, their words came from interviews the artists have done with Border Crossings magazine. I'm a convert to the value of artist talk and can say without reservation that I've been made a better critic because of the time I spent with artists in their studios looking and talking. I'm clearly not drinking enough. <coughs> Excuse me. In the third book of his treatise on architecture, Vitruvius says that sacred buildings should have the proportion of a man and the formal implications of applying the divine beauty of mathematics to the formation of the human body is everywhere apparent in classical art. Interestingly, we had to wait 1,500 years, somewhere around 1490, before we saw his ideas about human symmetry literally drawn to our attention in the famous rendering that you're looking at by, Michel by Leonardo. Vitruvius, Vitruvius concentrates on human proportion, and in the Hermes by Praxiteles from the 4th century BC, and the Apollo Belvedere, we see the pleasure that can be derived from this search after human perfection. And evidence of that perfection was best appreciated through bodies unencumbered by, doc by garments. The Greeks invent the nude as an art form in the fifth century. Kenneth Clark puts the advantages succinctly. The nude, he says, in his 1955 Mellon Lectures in Fine Art, remains the most com complete example of the transformation of matter into form. He would agree with the poet Edmund Spencer, who writes in the hymn in honor of beauty in 1596, for soul is form and doth the body make. This view of beauty had legs, so to speak. Winkelmann, the great 18th century German art historian, considered the Apollo Belvedere the highest ideal of art among all the works of antiquity. And he wrote about the spirit of the observer entering into this kingdom of beauty incarnate. Kenneth Clark declared that the overwhelming impression of the Hermes was one of grace, and of a gentle sweetness achieved partly by an almost morbid delicacy of execution. The language generated in response to these works, beauty incarnate and morbid delicacy, is utterly engaging. This is not objective criticism, and it makes clear that looking is a physical engagement with matter, with what matters. We too should look physically. Here's a cluster of paintings and sculptures that run from 16th century Germany in Lucas Cranach the Elder, his Venus is in the National Gallery in Ottawa, to Hans Bolding, who will be coming up, his Eve, a serpent in death, to 16th century Italy in Donatello's David, and Gustav Klimt's Hope. That's the Eve and the... You've got to check out the way that Eve looks at that snake, man. Now that's, that's a relationship starting. <laughs> to John Curran and Marlene Duma in our century. The Curran is called The Old Fence and was painted in 1999, and Duma painted Miss January in 1997. I want now to direct your gaze to a pair of paintings that would easily make my top 50 list of the most beautiful. I feel I need to apologize for such a list because in the most recent New Yorker that I just read on the, uh, on the train, Peter Sheldahl, in reviewing an exhibition of paintings by Piero della Francesca, cites Aldous Huxley saying that the Italian master's resurrection of Christ is the best picture in the world. I'm only saying two of 50. Sandra Botticelli's Birth of Venus and the Primavera. They tell us much about the vicissitudes of looking, of the pleasure given the beholder by the beheld. In the Birth of Venus, the goddess deftly covers the intimate parts of her body with either her hands or her luxurious hair. Botticelli's redhead is beautiful, but not sexual. We do look at her, but she's self-possessed, distracted with just a touch of melancholy. She's always the same woman all the women in the entourage, in the allegory of spring, the other title, including the three graces, are one and the same woman. 
I'm reminded, by the way, of a similar musing 500 years later that embodies another man's devotion to a single woman. Alex Katz has made his wife Ada the subject of countless paintings and drawings over the course of their 65-year-long marriage, initially in a slightly domesticated double sculptural portrait called Ada Ada in 1959, then more uptown a year later in the black dress, an irresistible oil on linen painting in which Ada does a half dozen turns, and finally in full-on glamour in another oil painting called The Black Jacket from 1972, where she appears five times in the same composition. Ada is graced by another name and by a larger number. You'll recall that Botticelli's three graces are discreetly diaphanous. They're part of a pictorial tradition which used the details of the myth as a showplace for ocular increase. The trio was conventionally posed to be seen from three angles, front, back, and in profile. In getting the full story, you also got the complete body. Alexander Cabanel's Venus is an altogether different kind of goddess than the one we see in Botticelli. They have in common an abundance of flowing hair. For Botticelli, it ensures her modesty. For Cabanel, it underlines something quite the opposite. Cabanel's Venus is complicit in being looked at. Nothing she has is unavailable to our eyes. It's astonishing to think that Cabanel painted his Venus in 1863, the same year that Manet painted Olympia. Today, they both hang in Paris in the Musée d'Orsay. Can any two paintings be about the same thing and be so completely different? What they share is a woman who's unclothed and who is being made or is making herself available to be looked at. Venus luxuriates in the come-hither pose of an odalesque, her left arm bent at the elbow and falling across her face so that it almost covers her eyes. In the sky, a quintet of putti with white and blue wings and dimpled and pinkened flesh tumble above the languorous goddess. Olympia is a different model. She wears slipper pumps, a bracelet, her infamous black choker, and a large orchid. She's short-waisted, a touch thick in the neck and torso, and she covers her pubic area not out of modesty as much as convenience. Where else would she put her hand? She looks directly at the viewer, at all viewers, and despite the fact that her servant brings in a bouquet of flowers, presumably from a gentle and admirer, this is a woman who is absolutely prepossessed. Her look out from the canvas meets the gaze looking in with equanimity. Cabanel's Venus looks out to encourage our looking in. She gives over. Olympia's is a gaze that takes over. Put simply, Manet's painting embodies a sea change. I want to turn to another pair of paintings that I regard as emblematic of a radical change in the way we think about beauty. Picasso's Demoiselle d'Avignon and Pierre Matisse's Blue Nude, the souvenir of Biscra, like the birth of Venus and Olympia, were painted in the same year, this time 1907. It is likely that Matisse's startling painting emboldened Picasso to paint the Demoiselle, and one can see why. Somehow in the passage of time and a lengthy acquaintance, they've done nothing to diminish the power of Matisse's achievement. There are obvious things to remark. The mask-like, inscrutable look of the model, the exoticized landscape, landscape occupied by a radicalized body, the uncompromising nature of the mark-making, the sheer audacity of the overall palette. But what I find most striking is the contrast between the crude left hand positioned on her black head and the delicacy in both tone and rendering of her right hand, the fingers of which are in close proximity to a small stand of purple flowers in the foreground. Matisse, more than any painter I can think of, is able to make lines and marks become forms, in this case parts of the body, that are so awkwardly put together that your reaction is incredulity when they end up being exactly right, which they always do. Her clumsy feet, the uneven rise of her hip, the inexplicable mix of blue and pink and pale yellow that forms her right shoulder, the way portions of her body are extended like visual echoes beyond the space the body occupies, these are all daring moves. But they are moves being made in a painting and only incidentally through the subject of the painting. The blue nude is made by the hand, but it finds its fullest appreciation in, the, in our mind's eye. Once you've seen it, you can never forget it. I'm similarly inclined towards Picasso's improbable painting. It too is a decoy. It uses the setting of a brothel not to refer to anything that happens in such a place. The lasting effect of Demoiselle has to do with the brutality of form rather more than an insult to propriety. The painting insists upon its resistance to being seen and understood as anything other than a painting. Picasso's indebtedness to African sculpture is well enough known, and you can recognize its influence in the face of the woman on the left. But no amount of cultural mashing accounts for the faces of the two women on the right-hand side of the composition. 
Their demeanor is more about architecture than flesh or bone. Their highlighted blue and green noses turn on their faces like walls. The woman in the center of the painting raises her arm above her head in a gesture that usually signifies display and erotic acquiescence. Matisse's nude also raises her arm above her head. Do either of these gestures make us think of desire? Is our looking and what we're looking at in these modern masterpieces, or when we're confronted by Victorine Miron, the woman looking at us from Manet's Olympia, the same as what we see when we take in Cabanel's Venus? I'm simply saying that it's impossible to look at the Venuses of Botticelli and Cabanel and at Olympia and the Blue Nude and see them with the same set of eyes. We need the compounded eye of the fly to see and understand what it is we're looking at. Looking is a nuanced engagement that involves a complex number of factors, including how the subject is presented, the intention of the artist, and our disposition towards what we're seeing. I think that seeing is a condition of perception that stops at the eye, or that thinks the eye is monocular. Understanding is seeing with intelligence, and intelligence is multi-eyed. Just as there are ways of seeing to abscond with John Berger's title, equally there are ways of looking. I think one of the cumulative effects of there being so many good women painters, depicting subjects that have traditionally been the property of male painters, has been to oblige us to be more discriminating and nuanced in our looking. Marlene Duma, the South African-born painter who lives in the Netherlands, comes at the problem head on. She looked at the painting of her generation and asked herself, where is the eroticism? Making art is always generated out of what we don't see, and Duma was responding to the unseen. Her paintings and works on paper, these are called Dorothy Delight and Male Beauty, immediately stake their physical claim on our attention. And then, through using the medium as a veil, as a slip towards diffusion, delicacy, and even disappearance, realign our first response. Dumas says that she aims to reveal and not display, and that art, if for art to be moving, it has to be ungainly. In this context, ungainly is a careful and beautiful word. The trouble with the slide is it doesn't show how perfect the lavender on the butt and cock of, and the hands of the, of the male beauty is. That's a, an extraordinary watercolor, that one. Just as the politics of looking have, has been complicated, so has the way we think about beauty undergone significant changes. It should be obvious in the way I was talking about the Blue Nude and Demoiselle that I hold these paintings in high regard. Whether I think they're beautiful or not is a more vexing question. If I take the purpose of beauty to be the production of things that are pleasing to look at, then describing the blue nude as beautiful is logical and sensible. Marlene Dumas sees beauty and ugliness in the same way. They are constructions. I'm not making ugly paintings, she told Border Crossings in 2004. I just don't want your type of beauty. Beauty, to be sure, has gone through some rough times. We've gone back to Praxiteles and the Apollo Belvedere. Barnett Newman, the American painter, said that the invention of beauty by the Greeks, that is, their postulate of beauty as an ideal, has been the bugbear of European art. And he observed, with a certain sense of approving majesty, that, quote, it's the impulse of modern art to destroy beauty. Beauty's reformation was considerably less dramatic in its enunciation than its disavowal from Newman's elevated perch, although the implications of beauty's return have been significant. The messenger in this case was Dave Hickey, and his account of offhandedly raising beauty's bruised and banished head at a conference in 1995 makes for splendid reading. In reading his description of the soft epiphany he underwent at a panel discussion on the subject of what's happening now, I'm playing John the Baptist to his Messiah, since he'll be in Guelph in two weeks to give the Shankman lecture. I urge you, if you can come down, by all means do. It should be a, an event. This passage is taken from The Invisible Dragon, Four Essays on Beauty. This is, I'm quoting from um, Dave. I was drifting, daydreaming really, drawing cartoon daggers on a yellow pad and vaguely, vaguely formulating strategies for avoiding punch and cookies, when I realized that I was being addressed from the audience. A lanky graduate student had risen to his feet and was soliciting my opinion as to what the issue of the 90s would be. Snatched from my reverie, I said beauty. And then more firmly, the issue of the 90s will be beauty a total improvis improvisatory goof, an off-the-wall jumpstart free association that rose unbidden to my lips from God knows where. Or perhaps I was being ironic, wishing it to be so, but not believing it likely. I don't know, but the total uncomprehending silence that greeted this modest proposal lent it immediate credence for me. Hickey's modest proposal was issued in the same year as the 1993 Whitney Biennale, the iteration of that contentious exhibition that was the most contentious of all. 
curated, curated by Elizabeth Sussman. It included the tape of the Rodney King meeting by the LAPD, a tape made not by an artist, but captured by a passerby on his cell phone. In this climate, beauty was irrelevant, even beneath consideration. But Hickey had let the cat out of the abject bag. Two decades later, beauty occupies a position of critical comfort, not because it hasn't been discussed, but because it has. It's a truism to say that ideas and critical thinking exist in a fluctuating state of action and reaction. Beauty has been and remains in that indeterminate float of affirmation and interrogation. Without commenting on each one, I want now to run by you a gallery of images that embody only a few of the limitless possibilities of today's representation. These are two images by Francis Bacon, a portrait of Peter Beard and two figures the latter painted in 1963. It's an excellent example of his ability to suggest sufficient turmoil in the act of love between two men that it becomes a wrestling match at best and at its most extreme, a life and death struggle. The small drawing of Peter Beard is one of the many that Bacon did of the jet-setting American photographer and diarist. Actually, um, uh, uh, Bacon gave Peter Beard a painting of, of him, uh, which Cheryl Teagues, who Peter was married to at that time, the first American supermodel, when they divorced, she took the painting. So not only did she get to be the first supermodel in America, but she also got a very good painting out of the, out of the divorce. So I don't know what that says about power, but he's bitter about that, losing that painting, by the way, Peter Beard. In connection with Bacon, I want to remind you that his Elizabethan namesake, the other Sir Francis, remarked that there is no excellent beauty that hath not some strangeness in the proportion. Lucian Freud, who, like all British painters with the possible exception of Cecily Brown, dispenses paint with equal degrees of serenity and disgust. Sunday Morning with Eight Legs and a portrait of the Australian London-based performance artist and giant about town Lee Bowery, uh, Freud's use of a thinned out teal, especially in the matching dimples on his cheeks that look as if they were made by a hole punch, delivers a visual, cl visual clout in the Bowery portrait. He's like a living memento mori. This pair is by a young American painter, Dana Schutz, who since her debut appearance with a character named Frank and a collection of self-eaters in 2002 has established a presence as an important painter. She was picked by Charles Saatchi, the, the advertising magnet, as one of the artists responsible for the triumph of painting in 2005. And her art formed the central metaphor for Barry Schwabsky's influential essay called An Art That Eats Its Own Head. Face Eater you won't be surprised which one that is, and twin parts are from that early body of work. Her figures are absorbed in a world of necessary assemblage in which they play Humpty Dumpty to their self-determined disassembly. They arrange and rearrange their constituent parts in an endless inventive process of renewal and corporeal reconstruction. Marlene Duma has said that painting is taking parts of the dead and making a living thing. Dana Schutz would come at the problem of constructing a painting in a slightly different way. In her methodology, painting is taking parts of the living and making another living thing. These two works, Homeless Harlequins and Couple on a Blue Striped Chair, are by George Kondo, the American painter who has systematically worked through the pictorial tropes and styles of early modernism to come up with a circus of his own devising. His harlequins nod knowingly and sadly to a time when Picasso could paint their ancestors with a special combination of poignant beauty. Kondo goes soft on recent art history, but he refuses to go sentimental. The sentimental is precisely where Jeff Koons, the eternal bad boy of American art, locates much of his art in the Banality series, his big attack Hummels, and where he wants to situate us as viewers. On your left, is it your left? Yeah. on this side, is Naked, a polychrome ceramic sculpture from 1988, and next to it is the Whitney Museum billboard for Made in Heaven, the, col the collaboration between Coons and his then lover and soon-to-be wife, Alona Stoller, a deputy member of the Italian parliament, and a porn star known as Cicalina. In their way, each image envisions and stages a sexual utopia. Naked appears to be an image of untainted innocence, Two birthday-suited children admiring a small bouquet, an early emblem of the unconscious seeds of romance. But when you look at where the eyes of the young girl are focused, they go below the proffered flowers. Maybe she's inspired by the pronounced floral stamen, but her eyeline makes it clear that her attention is on the stamen of the future and not the one that he so protectively holds. In this regard, it's worth recalling the look in the eyes of Eve in Baldung's painting as she surveys and touches the thickness of the coiling snake's tail. 
In the billboard image, the snake is present as well. He plays best supporting serpent on the stage set for the swooning Chickalina and the preening coons. This is an image of paradise regained, a sort of post post lapsary in Eden. The Made in Heaven project resulted in certainly the most hardcore body of work in many media, from photography to sculpture to works in glass, ever produced for public display by an artist with a mainstream reputation. I didn't bring any of the hardcore. The hardcore stuff is real hardcore. <laughs> real hardcore. Even here, though, in this modest proposal of a billboard, Coons can't let slide the opportunity for a sexual game. His thumb, which sticks out from under his lover's back, is distinctly phallic, a kind of stand-in for the stand-up that's promised in the work's title and, was, and that was realized in the completed project. Kuhn's entire strategy has been to take over visual forms that already have some claim to recognized authority, from kitsch figurines to pornography. For him, the world is a ready-made. He's like a kid, all eyes and appetite, in a sensuously appointed and eroticized candy store of his own fabrication. What he does in this environment is, is to take objects and images he fancies and nominate them to the status of art. In a way, he's playing Adam's game. He gets to name the world into meaning. I should say, by the way, as an aside, that um, uh, I interviewed Coons on two occasions and Chickalina once. Coons once in Chicago, uh, live, then once uh, by the phone when he was in Munich making figurines. And then Chickalina came to Winnipeg to do a strip show. Um, the funny thing about that was she wasn't allowed in the States because she was a deputy member as a communist. And of course, America wouldn't let her in. So Coons couldn't meet with her and they were meeting everywhere other than in America. So she came to, to do this strip show, but she couldn't bring her pet snake. She used to strip with a snake. So the Canadian government wouldn't let her bring the snake across the border. So she was, kind of didn't have her props. She did this incredible performance where she, I mean, I don't go to strip clubs a lot ever, actually. And Mika and I went to the strip club, and they gave us like a front pole seat, quite literally. And here we were watching Chickalina do her gyrations. And while she's doing them, she's saying things like, you old guys with a trench coat, you're going to get AIDS if you don't be careful. You got and she was giving, it was just an unbelievable thing. They only had her do one of the two scheduled performances because it was so unusual. And so I went to interview her afterwards because we wanted to do this combined interview in an issue. And Jeff had told me by the, on the phone that, that he was going to marry her. So as we were doing the interview afterwards, I said, congratulations on your upcoming marriage. And she said, what? I said, well, you and Jeff are getting married. She knew nothing about it. So she burst into tears. So we got to announce to Chickalina that Jeff was marrying her. <laughs> they married, had a child, the bitterest divorce in the history of contemporary art. She kidnapped the child for three years. He tried to get it back. It got, he doesn't, it, anyway, it, it didn't work out well. It didn't work out well. But they, they described themselves in the interview um, as a newly minted, sexualized Adam and Eve in the Garden of, of, of Edenic Love. So the, the interview is fabulous as a piece of history um, that Jeff would much prefer to forget. <laughs> now another interlude of images, and please accept my promise that nothing's implied in the second half of that word. These from a generation of artists who were tagged the YBAs, young British artists, they're now MABAs, they're middle-aged British artists because we're all getting older, and they were pushing the body in their own directions. Both Tracy Emin and Sarah Lucas claim sexuality as their theme, and each produced installations in which the bed was used as a surrogate, a kind of magnified spatial metonymy for the artist herself. The chaotic bed is Emin's My Bed, here, and from 1998. The pantomime bed is Lucas's Au Naturel from 1994. Taken together, they remind us of the accuracy of the line by the Canadian poet Robert Croach when he says, the bed is ark to all the world's destruction. This is Bunny Gets Snookered from 1997, uh, closest to me uh, by Sarah Lucas, and Portrait with Fried Eggs, um, a self-portrait with fried eggs, actually, by Lucas. These sewn pieces, just like nothing, with the script uh, sewn on it, from 2009, and Head Falling, the figure with the head falling off, are recent evidence of Emmons' abject embroidery. Head falling is yet another reminder of how many contemporary artists are offering up broken bodies in their work. To return to Edmund Spencer, if soul is the form that makes the body, then these artists are very damaged souls indeed. We're taught the value of what we see through the formal conventions of display. One of those conventions is the way public art is privileged, particularly the kind made of marble and given a prominent pedestal. 
Mark Quinn has taken that tradition at face value. From 2005 to 2007, he installed on the fourth plinth in Trafalgar Square a 12-foot tall statue made from Carrera marble of his friend, the artist Alison Lapper, who was born without la arms and with truncated legs. Called Alison Lapper pregnant, it shows her naked and fully pregnant, a representation of what he called a new model of feminine heroism. Lapper saw her statue as a modern tribute to femininity, disability, and motherhood. Quinn's gesture is a layered and ingenious one in the way that it asks, what is public art for and who should it honor? It also says something about our inclination to aestheticize the statuary fragment. As a representation, Lapper's complete body is conventionally incomplete. She appears broken, but she's actually whole. What Quinn's monument does is to take the aesthetic of the fragment that has come to us through the way that we fetishize the remains of classical sculpture and gives it an altogether new reading. He's done the same thing with the accepted form of the self-portrait, bust. On this side here uh, is a portrait bust in the classical mold that looks like a distance, it uh, looks from a distance like a classical bronze head. Uh, and then the piece here uh, is called self-bloodhead. Its companion piece, the one closest to me, is called shithead. And these are literal descriptions of, of the material, blood and excrement, from which the sculptures have been made. The YBA who pushes with the most weight is Jenny Seville. These large paintings are called Hem and Rubens Flag. They're both oil on canvas, and they're 10 foot set by 7 and 10 foot by 8 feet, respectively. No less a critical luminary than Linda Auckland said in 2003, when these paintings were first exhibited, that Seville was, quote, the most interesting and most exciting painter of our time. After observing that this work makes her think that John Singer Sargent had mated with Willem de Kooning, that would have been something. I'd want to be in on that one, a fly on the wall, to use a multi-eyed phrase. She goes on to credit the 28-year-old artist at that time with reinventing the art form, where painterliness is pushed so far that it signifies a kind of d disease of the pictorial. Saville herself has said that her interest is not in getting an illusion of the female body, but in painting areas of flesh. It's as if the paint tends to become the body, when I put the paint on in layers, she told the critic David Sylvester, it's like adding layers of flesh. I wanted the idea of cutting into the paint, like you could cut into the body. It evokes the idea of surgery. Creating surfaces that look like living cadavers, and there is something of a zombie palette in Saville's work, marks her as an, an emblem of where we find ourselves in the 21st century. As Nochlin says, she's rec recreated painting in the image of our own ominous and irrational times. In 1920, the American poet Ezra Pound addressed this idea of finding an image that gives voice to the temper of the times in a suite of poems called Hugh Selwyn Moberly. The age demanded an image, he wrote, of its accelerated grimace, something for the modern stage, not at any rate an attic grace. If Nocklin is right, then Saville and her contemporaries are giving us the images that embody what our age is asking for. There is no attic grace here either. If if Jenny Seville has taken flesh and raised its scale quotient, two graduates of the painting program at Yale are equally interested in the function and texture of exaggeration. John Curran and Lisa Uscavich are body painters in both hearings of that word. John Curran is notorious for his improbably endowed women and more latterly for a series of paintings using images from 70s Danish porn. I've uh, I'm also not showing you those really. Given what I might have shown, these two paintings are a deliberate reprieve. On, on this side is Big Hands from 2010, and on the left, Thanksgiving from 2003. Curran employs what I call decoy aesthetics. His desire is to make something beautiful out of a degraded image. You can say I'm hiding behind the easy difficulty of an aggressively off-putting image, he told me last year, like a pornographic image, but I'm not really into transgression. My prime directive is to make a beautiful painting because beauty is another guarantor of permanence. There's always something wrong with the bodies in a current painting. In big hands, the young woman's head is too small for her shoulders and her oversized hands. In Thanksgiving, the blood sitting below the obscenely well-painted turkey is so perfect that it will create vegetarians around the room. I think the upsetting thing about beauty, Curran says, is that you're simultaneously comforted and hurt by it. Lisa Uscavich is an old holds barred, barred painter as well. 
Couch from 2003 is classic Yuskavich, gorgeous vulgarity, looking within looking, an inclination to outcaban Cabanel. In The Mound from 2011, it's as if the young girl has run outdoors to escape Daddy Balthus and then, against the theatrical backdrop of the sky, enacts the very poses he's taught her to strike. And who else could paint that sky? In a 2004 interview in Border Crossing, Zhuskavich said, what is always interesting about contemporary art is its wrongness, not its rightness, and the way it creates inevitability. She raids popular culture for her images, and sometimes popular culture returns the raid. Here is Half Family, her painting from 2003, and next to it is a fashion shot in which Kate Moss is dressed as the painting. Yuskavich was the costume consultant for, the, for W Magazine, and I have to admit that my preference is for the socks on the painted model to the ones on the living model, but, but that may be part of the vast subjectivity that I've been talking about. Cecily Brown paints the body because she gets to use oil paint to do it. She's among the finest painters of her generation. She is a YB heir, and she's the most omnivorous looker at painters of earlier generations. She admits to the constant influence of a shifting rotor of my top 50, and they come and go at different times. She's drawn not to the workers in song, as Leonard Cohen would say, but to the painters in flesh. Titian, Rubens, Lucien Freud, and Willem de Kooning. But her flesh isn't British. She's managed to escape what she described to border crossings as the English tradition of muddy paint and thick surfaces. Her recollection is that she was completely uninhibited looking at Guston and de Kooning and, quote, felt it was absolutely possible to make big, messy, macho paintings. It was an equally arrogant desire, but it wasn't as a woman, it was as a painter. From that position, Brown has painted some of the most erotically charged painterly paintings of the last 20 years. That's Bacchanel uh, on this 2002, uh, and The Strand from 2009. You can, if you, it's not a Where's Waldo thing. The, these are paintings in which the figure disintegrates and reforms, um, and they're luscious to look at and to be around. This is the same painting twice. This is in new Lubotten pumps. Any of you who are, you've got a fancy shoe fetish would know the title from 2005. She relies on the image to do some of the foreplay in her painterly seduction. If I liked you scavenge's socks, I gotta tell you, I really like the pumps. The Duma painting on top was made in 1988 and is called Snow White and the Broken Arm. The one below by Dana Schutz is called Presentation. Snow White and the Broken Arm shows the cartoon character lying on a table more than a bed, naked with her right arm wrapped just below the shoulder in bandages. In her hand she holds a camera and scattered about the floor below her are a number of photographs. They could be Polaroids, but they hold no image. Looking in are her seven housemates, their fingers grasping the ledge they peer over as if they were eager or apprehensive children. Looks on their dark faces run from anger with to sympathy towards the subject of their attention. The painting is one of, a, one of a series Duma produced in the late 1980s that included variations on Snow White and her brood of gazers, as well as a pair of paintings with the titles Waiting for Meaning and Losing Her Meaning. As the name suggests, the meaning of these paintings is, is contingent. We wait for it, and when it arrives, it is gone. What are we to make of the layers of seeing in Snow White and the Broken Arm? Her eyes are open, and she's looking up. Has she been looking through the eye of the camera, or has she been the subject of its monocular gay eye? What are the dwarves thinking as they look in at her damaged body? One clue to where their power resides in these paintings, or more obviously, where it is not located, is that they're based on Dumas' experience working in a mental health facility. Presentation, the large work by Dana Schutz, painted in 2005, also shows a figure with a damaged right arm suspended in a sling so that a doctor can poke around in the patient's hand with a sharp instrument, likely a scalpel. It's not clear, entirely clear what is going on here, but it seems to be an anatomy class in that the figure, a cadaver, is cut open and his left foot has been severed from his leg. A crowd of hundreds of people watch the procedure as best they can. Schutz did similar pictures at this time, including the auto autopsy of Michael Jackson in 2005 and a year earlier surgery in which five women observe, observe while two women doctors cut and sew the almost disappearing body of a female patient. The looking in these paintings is medical and forensic, but it also draws our attention to a dimension of seeing that plays into the invasive and the spectacle. As Dumas and Schutz indicate, there is lots to look at and many lookers. These two paintings of groups of onlookers are also privileged to look in, 
It's a forensic gaze, a surveillant one, a possessive one, a repugnant one. The adjectives are as varied as the lookers. The crowd is the compounded eye. It has the singular advantage of multiple perspectives. How we look at the world we live in and the people we live in it with remains an ongoing fascination. Art is the ritual that articulates that social engagement. It is a ceremony of recognition. It counts. These are two images of Marilyn Monroe, another Venus who lived among us. Uh, the one, of course, by Andy Warhol, and the other one by Marlene Dumas. Warhol's is an incorruptible dazzle. Her painting on this side is called Dead Marilyn. It's a small 16 by 19 inch oil on canvas, and it's a devastating image. What if Dumas is right? If all painting is about eros and death, then the attendant emotions are desire and fear, and we use painting as a way of expressing those unavoidable emotions. And what if we are more aware of them than ever? that what we see reflected in contemporary painting is the construction of our desire as an antidote, as an oppositional force, as a repositioning. It may explain the ferocity of the assault on beauty, and it also explains the need and the persistence of beauty's pictorial expression. We desire desire because we fear fear. I want to return to the gaze as a way of ending and to discuss another pair of paintings by Marilyn Dumas, the death of the author, closest to me in 2003, and Dead Girl from 2002. The Death of the Author is an extraordinary painting that shows evidence of what I would call a beautiful control of tone. The range of temperatures of white and ivory urge the painting towards the monochromatic. The idea of the blank space is itself an opposite direction for a painting about death to take. But look at the line, like a turbulent horizon, where the author's head touches the, the bed. The bruised yellow, a thin blue peeking out underneath, a dot of teal, an encrusted rose, then almost nothing until we get to the cake blood on the hairline of the right extremity. Compare this delicate turmoil with the crisp, starch line of the sheet covering the author's mouth. A dead person is the person who is most thoroughly susceptible to the imbalance of power that resides in the gaze. The dead can never look back. The source was a deathbed photograph of Celine that she found in a newspaper in 1986. Celine had died in 1961. Dumas' commentary about the painting is revealing. There's half a face like an egg, the top part of the egg showing. There's a geometry of tragedy at work. The sheet, like a Malevich rectangle, comes from the outside. The skull is bending, pulled down by gravity, while the lower eye, like a vertical cut through the face, mediates between the two parts. I hope I'm not fetishizing the painting in suggesting that the vertical cut is also sexual. As Dumas says, all painting is about eros and death. It's also, as she suggests in the reference to Malevich, about the continuous life of painting. Excuse me. There's another way of thinking about this painting, The Death of the Author, and that's through the lens of Roland Barthes' famous 1967 essay called The Death of the Author. Barthes' essay is primarily an assault on the authority of the art of writing and a valorizing of the act of reading. But there are things that Barthes says about written language that are applicable to painted language. The weight of the essay falls on the reader-viewer, and when Barthes says, the work is eternally written here and now, it is easy to substitute one art for the other. The work is eternally painted in the here and now as well. If a text is a tissue of quotations, to use his phrase, so is the painting. Dumas is reiterating that she, as a painter, is part of that tissue, and that we, as viewers, complete the painting. Let me turn now to the final image, another representation of ending. Dead Girl was painted in 2002, but the source picture sat in her studio for 17 years before she could find a way of using it. Dead Girl was something I found very fearful to paint, she told me in 2004, because sometimes I'm very primitive and I feared the painting as if it were a voodoo thing. Death and fear are among those things that never go away. And fear of a loved one dying is worse than fear of your own death or of the passion involved when a loved one leaves you, or the terrible prospect of having no passion. Dead Girl is a virtuoso painting made, as she said, very quickly and very intensely. The girl's destroyed face is surrounded by black hair. At the top of her head, three talons of rust-colored blood have dried on her skin. The blood below her nose joins her mouth in a congealed smudge. Mouth and nose are indistinguishable. Her eyebrows arc like small crimson fish across her forehead. But what is most disturbing is that her eyes, occluded and dark, remain open. 
they register a flat emptiness that is almost unbearable. It's as if they'd drawn all seeing from the world. Is anything more final than the open-eyed gaze of the dead? We note that the interlocking marks below her mouth have the delicate such touch of Cy Twombly, that the combination of a, of a strong vertical bar falling from the top left-hand side of the painting mixed with the dirty vanilla ground has the rudimentary beginnings of a Motherwell elegy, that the roughly applied red on her blouse shows that Ellsworth Kelly might have been a forensic investigator cleaning his brush on the clothes of the body he's investigating. In the face of this kind of calamity, we rummage around in the attics and basements of art history. Maybe more the basements. In the circus animal's desertion, William Butler Yeats writes, Now that my ladder's gone, I must lie down where all the ladders start, in that foul rag and bone shop of the heart. But it's a stopgap measure, a deflection, a strategy of self-protection. We're left with a profound condition of death. But let me turn Augustinian for a moment and suggest that death is merely the absence of life and that its medium is painting. It's a complicated recognition, and there is a way, paradoxically, that these two magnificent paintings of the dead, if we look at them closely, render us emotionally alive and attentive. I would go further. I would say these are deeply moral paintings. They bring out our richest and our best looking without the sentimentality and the easy sense of drama that attends upon the, that attends upon the end of things. I know as well that I would be opening up a whole other can of beautiful worminess were I to say that they're sublime paintings. Thanks. That's it.